Here's what you're missing over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. And today we have an old friend back on uh, to talk more about uh, some people featured in his book. The book is Gettysburg Rebels by Tom McMillan. And Tom is our guest. Hello, Tom. Matt, good to be back. Good to have you back. Always nice to talk to you. Uh, Today we are talking about uh, Hoffman. Hoffman. I'm, I'm blanking on his first name. What was his first name? Charles William C W C W. That was the father, and the then father. his three sons. Yes, who with Wesley Culp moved south, and uh, he grew up in Gettysburg, and ended up fighting for the Confederate Army and being here during the Gettysburg campaign. So there were three Hoffman boys that went down with him. Tell us a little bit about father, the father C W. Well, if I could just get, did how I found them because when I started this project to do the Gettysburg Rebels, the the Gettysburg guys who fought for the Confederates in the Battle of Gettysburg, I only thought there were two. Right, Wesley Culp and Henry Wentz. That was my my purpose. You right. know, Culp's Hill. Those Wentz, are the famous Wentz ones. House. Yeah, those are the ones people know. And I wanted to dig into those. And as I'm researching, to the extent that Wesley Culp was written about at all, it was that he went south in 1856 to Shepherdstown mm-hmm. uh, uh, with his uh, employer, a carriage maker named Charles William Hoffman, C.W. Hoffman. Said, okay, well, that's the reason he went. He went for work. I looked up C.W. Hoffman in the 1850 Gettysburg census, and he had three young boys age 10, 8, and 6. So if you add 10, 11 years to their ages, mm-hmm. would have been of age to be Fighting more men. soldiers. Sure. Than whom. So I went to the National Archives, and sure enough, Robert Frank and Wesley Hoffman, all born in Gettysburg and all raised on the second block of Chambersburg Street, were not only in the Confederate Army, but in units that came north with Robert E. Lee. So that gave me all, all of a sudden it went from two to five mm-hmm. uh, guys who basically... Other than William Frazanito, who mentioned them in one of his books, I don't. I've never had never seen any mentions. Jim Hessler did one too. We were starting to pick out little tidbits, but nobody knew much about them. And certainly, the average Gettysburg visitor had no knowledge. Sure. Um, so okay, so he's got three sons. Why? Why does he move down? Now, let's talk about C.W. Yeah. Uh, a little bit. I, I, I thought my wife, Colleen, who helped me with this research, is a much better researcher than me. Said we're doing this. She said I think C.W. Hoffman is going to be a key to this story. I said, ah, he's not. He's just a guy. <laughs> He was very much a key to this story. The thing that really shocked me was how prominent he was in Gettysburg mm-hmm. in the 1840s and 1850s. I'd never heard his name. You hear the names Von Stock and Bueller and Schmucker and Michael Jacobs and all those, those names that, that we all know. He was right where, right there with them in those decades before, uh, before the war. He was. Uh, he owned multiple businesses. He owned at least ten pieces of property mm. in and around town. He was elected three times to borough council. He was a trustee of the Methodist Episcopal Church, which is where the GR post is mm-hmm. now. Uh, he was on the temperance committee, so he was a big teetotaler. And I think you know, his place was on Chambersburg Street. It was right near where the Gary Owen was. It'd probably be yeah. sometimes I'll toast CW to Gary <laughs> Owen. He would not be happy. He, would and not. he was he was on the committee that in the mid eighteen fifties created and founded a new cemetery in town. Two words, Evergreen Cemetery. Mm-hmm. He's in the newspaper ad about that. Right. Where you know we always know that's why it's Cemetery Hill, where Lincoln gave the Gary Address, but he was involved in all that stuff. So it was, uh, why did this guy leave? I mean, just in, in, I say 19, in 1854, he had just run for and been elected to a three year term on Gettysburg Council, and he had just opened a new steam mill on what's basically now Franklin Street. Mm-hmm. So he'd opened a new business and committed to a three year term. It sounds like he's, dig- he's setting deeper roots down. Right. And within a year and a half, he's gone. And nobody seemed to know. He went, he, you know, he, carriage business was big down in Virginia and Chapperstown. He moved his carriage shop there. Uh, but what I found from uh, he was a Methodist trustee or uh, a trustee of the Methodist Church. So I looked through Methodist Church records. And my, my laugh line in my book talk is if uh, you want to fall asleep, read Methodist Church records from the 1850s. <laughs> but, but in the middle of all those, I found an item that he had been uh, he'd been in a fight 
with a fellow carriage maker. They had a big fight, presumably in the square. They beat each other with sticks and rods and stones. And and uh, and C.W. was arrested. He was charged. Uh, he was briefly suspended from the Methodist Church. He within six months he's off borough council. He was basically humiliated yeah. by this act. Yeah, we don't know why. Which, it happened. which seems out of character for him, the way you describe him. It, it, it from from his. I mean, we don't know. You never know their personality. Sure. But he was a very accomplished guy. Now, he's obviously very driven. Uh, who knows what happens? It, it, was, it was a fellow carriage maker. I'm assuming there we will never know. I'm assuming there was some sort of business. Probably. Dispute. Yeah. I don't know. But it was quite a vicious uh, uh, fight. So he uh, I found the grand jury proceedings <laughs> and he was fined. Uh, I think $40, which probably was a lot of money back then. And, and very quickly, not immediately, but very quickly, within a little more than a year, you see he's off borough council uh, and he's starting to put his property up for sale. Yeah. In 1856, in the spring, he's moving He's moving his entire operation. They, they took pretty much a part of the block there, you know, the, the second block of Chambers. Yeah, it's a, a when of, you list the buildings that he's got, it's a lot. It's quite a spread. Yeah. He had quite a spread. Basically the whole block. Yeah, and, and he picks up and, and leaves and goes to Shepherdstown. Uh, and so he takes with him his three sons and Wesley Culp. So yeah. he would have had no idea at the time, but he's taking with him f- four future Confederate soldiers. So he uh, now I had heard that he moved there because uh, a lot of his, if not most of his clients, were in Virginia. Have you heard that before? Yes, very, very well. There, there could have been business reasons for it. Uh, that was where a lot of business was done. But he was setting, settling down in Gettysburg. It's not that far. He right. was doing business that way anyway. Th- that's kind of a reason why if he was going to leave, that's why he went there. Right, okay. It's not why he left, but it's why he got went, it. okay, I know a place that's pretty close. I've done some business down there before. I, I'm going to set it settle up there. And, he went, and his brother went with him, too. And his brother... Uh, John Hoffman stayed there. He he only was in Jeffersonstown for a few years, but but that that was the big transition, and you know, and it changed these four young guys' lives, his life, and these four young guys' lives forever. It's amazing that the you know sometimes the one person's decision affects so many other lives and changes the course of uh, well, not the course of history, but it uh, you know a, a, a nice little trivial historical fact. You you never know, and how many of those things yes. ha- have happened in history that we we didn't know about. You wouldn't have known. I just decided to dig into the story, and I stumbled into this. Yeah. Well, you were and, explaining how you found the information uh, on the Hoffman family. Yeah. Tell that story. I we. We were looking around. There was just not a lot of information. I ended up tracking down uh, about nine living descendants who were all excited to talk to me, but had no information. Uh, I knew more than they did. They yeah. said, what do you, can you tell us anything about? <laughs> um, but there was mention uh, online of, uh, of a Hoffman family genealogy that somebody had written. And it was it was in the, the Dallas Library, Dallas, Texas. And we wanted to see if we could get it set up here in our library alone. It's not published. It's just loose paper. Mm. You have to come here. So my wife had a uh, had a conference down in Dallas as I was doing this book, fortunately. And I went down, went to the library, and, and we found it. And a, a, a descendant in, in 1980 had done all this work just to find out his family. Right. And C.W. Hoffman and those guys were, were part Part of it, and and so I it really that's the most information. What a with, stroke with, of luck that oh, is! W- without that, I couldn't have written. It would have been a, this would have been a large magazine story on Wesley Culp and, and Henry Wentz. Right, right. Without the Hoffman story, I couldn't have done it. And you know, it's maddening, it's frustrating because you you only have the tip of the iceberg. You don't have everything. You don't have very much, but it was just enough. And you know, sometimes as we were speaking before the show with. People are used to uh, reading and writing, hearing about generals, Stonewall Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, Winfield Scott Hancock. They've left lots of letters and lots of papers, and their families have saved everything. Most of the people who fought in the war were like these guys. Right. They just fought in the war, and then they went back to their lives, and they weren't anything special, and their families didn't save anything. We don't know their story. So, you know, the one thing, uh, I always read the reviews online, and they were, they were very positive, but one... Native, a young, I can tell it's a young person because of the photo. Said, I, I would like to have more primary sources. Hey, pal, so would I. Sometimes <laughs> there aren't any. It's yeah. not like I, I, I was convinced that I got as much as I could find, and the debate was. 
it, it's not what you normally put in the book, but I thought, but if nobody, I've done all this work, this story deserves to be told. Even if it's only part of the story, at least it adds to the, to the, to the, to the Gettysburg legacy. Yeah, and, and you I never know who's going to read it and who might, uh, might stumble find upon. Else. Yeah. I was hopeful that somebody would read it and say, that's who that photo yeah. is that, that has not happened. Um, Where are you telling me? And I, forgive me if I'm confusing with someone else, but weren't you telling me that you tracked down someone's descendants in like Kansas? Was that you? No, no, I was in you, Kansas. You, but you my, my tracking down, in addition to this, office up was Wesley Culp's descendants who had some letters. They were in Harrisburg. Bill Fresnito had mentioned a name, uh, a man named Fonstock, with a name famous in Gettysburg, who had some of Wesley Culp's letters. And th- that was in his book, uh, Early Photography. Uh, I looked the man, the gentleman up online, and he had passed away, but I found his obituary, so I cold wrote letters to his two sons who lived in their Harrisburg. One wrote back, he had nothing. The other wrote back, and he said, Mr. McMillan, I have all of my dad's materials. I wasn't very interested in this. You can look at whatever I have. So I thought that he would let me come up and put on a white glove. <laughs> and the next day, he texted me, and he said, uh, I put them in the mail to you. He mailed me 1860 letters written by Wesley Cole oh my and his God. brother William. And wow. luckily, they got there. Yeah. I, t- I tell you, Matt, you, your hands shake when you're holding something written in the 1860s. I bet. But so as a result now— that man, Mike Fonstock, is very interested, and his family's interested, and yeah. so the story is now kept. But th- that's how we lose things. I think he didn't know what he had, yeah. and probably in a move, you know, the, the next move, they might have been thrown out. So yeah. we lose so much. Can so you imagine just to imagine so how much of that stuff have we lost that that descendants, sons and daughters, and just don't know. And I'm moving. I get rid of this old box, and I threw this stuff away. And, and so occasionally you can you can come across. So I certainly didn't find everything in this story, but I found enough to tell the story credibly. I thought, and it was, and the Hoffman story just throughout just continued to fascinate me. Yeah. Uh, because of their role in the town here. Yeah. And I did not know there was a C.W. Hoffman sign on the second block of Chambersburg. <laughs> yeah, you were saying that before. Right across the Gary, because it's the last building that remains of his. There's a building still there. It's, it looks like a, a duplex now, but that's the last building of his of his complex. And there is a little sign in front, but it's not a touristy area, so a lot of tourists don't ever see right. it. And uh, it's is it the? I'm trying. I, I know where the sign. I mean, I've seen the sign, but now I'm. It's one seventeen one nineteen. Uh, it's not the wooden house by the bank. No, it's that's the Tate right, House, it's, right? It's, it's next to that. It's, it's next, next to that. Okay, yeah. and all that was part of CW's property, right? Up, up through the bank. Okay, uh, but it's 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 the next one. It's a, you know just just a regular. You wouldn't notice. It's just a building in Gettysburg. It looks right. like a Gettysburg building. Right, right. Uh, and there's just this little sign out in front. And, well, that's the thing we were talking before about it, and and how um, if I had seen it prior to moving back here in 2018, I never read it. Yeah. Because I didn't recognize the name that was in the bold yeah, letters and, on top. And he, it's about right? him. So yeah. And he didn't fight. It mentions right. Wesley Cole, but it doesn't mention any of his sons. People obviously did. Most people even don't know that story. Yeah. Um, hopefully now we can, you know, if they ever redo the sign, we can add a, a, a few a few more details. To it. But it's just, it's fascinating. But also then I thought, and then we're jumping ahead of ourselves, when those guys all come back for the Battle of Gettysburg, imagine... I mean, they lived right in the town. Yeah. They lived a block and a half from the town They're square. They're occupying their hometown. Yes. It's yes, so weird yes. to think yeah, about. Wesley, Wesley called work, and that's where the Hoffmans grew up. Yeah. And so now, Wesley Culp, we've talked about him on another episode. You can go back and listen to that. Uh, but Wesley Culp works for Hoffman. Yeah. That's why he goes south. Yes. And, and I think uh, a lot of people... Um, maybe hear that you know there were Gettysburg residents who fought for the Confederacy, and they assume that they the war left broke out. In the war, and, yeah, yeah, and they left, for, and they and went down south. Reasons. No, these right. guys, those guys all went in '56, and the first thing that Wesley and Robert Hoffman, the oldest of the Hoffman sons, they were 16, 17 years old. First thing they did was join a militia unit in mm. Sherpastown. You yeah. know, one, that's what you do. That's what you did. That's, yeah. that's and especially for a newcomer to a town. You know, you get to it's a social you know, club. march around, but it's a social club. Sure. You get to meet people, and we're here. We're going to defend our new town. And what better way to meet uh, chicks in yeah. a uniform, right? <laughs> Walking around town Absolutely. in a uniform? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what they did right away. And and so that five years later, it's that unit, as happened throughout the North and the South, they became Company B of the 2nd Virginia, yes. the militia unit, enlisted en masse as William Culp's up here in Gettysburg. William Culp's militia unit did the same thing. Mm-hmm. That's what happened, and 
William Culp, Wesley's older brother, also worked for Hoffman and was offered to, to move south. But he was a little bit older. He was married, just starting a family. He wasn't going to leave. Wesley was 16, 17 years old. He, and you can tell he was an adventurous sort. I'm going. I'm yeah, traveling. Sure. Let's face it. Back then, most people, especially most teenagers— had not been more than 10 miles from where they lived. Right. You didn't go to, you know, there wasn't spring break down in Florida. You didn't travel <laughs> very far. Spring break. You didn't, you they wish they had a spring far. break. So going to Shepherdstown was like going to the moon. Yeah. Listen to the rest of this interview and dozens like it. Support the show and get early access to special episodes, early and discounted ticket sales, and more. The second lieutenant level and above gets access to all monthly Patreon episodes. So please go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg, choose a tier, and join. And I thank you in advance.